All right. Hey, Greg. Hey, how you doing, Peter? I'm doing well. How you doing? Awesome. Happy Thursday. Yeah, happy Thursday. I hope the weather is as beautiful there as it is here in Oregon today. Yeah, it's kind of gloomy today. It looks like we're going to get some rain, but, you know, still going to get outside for that walk. Right on. You know? Yeah, I've got I've got my my co pilot here somewhere waiting for his after the after the show. He's he's waiting to head out. Yeah, what, how many dogs do you have? I have one dog, two cats right now. Okay. Of course, they're not with me. The cats aren't with me today, but they're at the house. Yeah, tell me about tell me about your pets. I mean, how are you how old is your dog? What's their name? Yeah, he's five years old. Where is he? Travis. His name is Travis. Come here, buddy. Yeah, he's sleeping. He, we call him a Chihuahua because we think he's, oh, here he comes. We think he's half Chihuahua or part Chihuahua. Oh, my gosh. He is so cute. Yeah, Travisura is his full name. That's uh, mischief in Spanish. So he's, <laughs> he's my best buddy. He comes, walks to work with me every day and makes everything best. How old is he? He's five. He's five? He's five. I'm sure, I'm sure he's getting like all these amazing herbs and a beautiful diet. Yes. All what kinds you, of things. Plus, just get plus, ready to know, plus an ice cream once in a while. <laughs> so yeah, so what is his diet like? His and, and what are you like what's in his bowl? I really want to know that. Well, I you know, I feed as much raw as possible. Um, I always make sure to add some veggies. I, I mix it up. You know, he never eats the same food more than a week in a row. I mean, they're like us. It's not just a it's not just a a nutritional physical need, but there's an emotional need too. You know, everyone that has a dog will notice that they're pretty stomach driven animals. They like to eat, they like food, they like enjoyment of food. So I change it up. I you know, right now he's eating chicken, chicken and veggies and a variety of supplements, fish oil, digestive enzymes. Do you put any organs in there, or is it like boneless chicken? Or um, usually, it's ground bones and all. I have a Maverick meat grinder. Anyone that doesn't have one of those, they're two hundred and fifty dollars delivered to your door, postage free. Travis, we're on, man. <laughs> anyway, um, Ellie's over here. You can drop a whole chicken in the thing. You just quarter it up and drop it right through, and it grinds it bones and all. It's really mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, I was looking into the grinder at one point. I know they can do like you know, poultry bones, right? But then like the harder yeah. bones, they really. No, no, the whole, yeah, the harder bones are more difficult. Yeah, you got to get a, a more serious. All right, we got grinder for that. Kathy, Samantha, Todd, Linda, Wendy. How's it going, guys? Thanks for joining. We're live with Greg Tilford, Animal Herbalist, Animal Essentials. Uh, you even have another website, theanimalherbalist.com that I just Yeah, I also out. have a, yes, The Animal Herbalist is my blog, which I have been neglecting severely. And I have a um, a podcast too called Your Vital Pet, which we'll be picking up again this week. I'll have another episode starting up real soon. I, I want to get one out every week, but the COVID-19 put me on the road and kind of changed that. And I, I just didn't have time to keep up with it. But stay tuned, folks. I mean, you, Your Vital Pet is still vitally important and it's still there. And, and we're going to have a, a whole lineup of new guests and and uh, I'm also writing a, an online course on herbal medicine, too, for everybody and something somebody can access and, and learn things while you're you're still kind of tied up at home and, and such. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll definitely sign up for that. Oh, looks like our special guest is here. Uh, Who could that be? We had some technical difficulties while we were getting ready here, but let's see if this works. Dr. Roman, she might be having the same issues that you were having, Greg. Let's see. Oh, Mary says she's excited for the online course. When can we expect that? I would expect that next month. Next month? Yeah, I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch with you. I'll send a blast out to everybody. Yes, please. It's ready to go. And I'm, I'm still writing it. I'm still formatting it using Teachable. 
which okay. uh, yeah. And uh, I think everybody's going to like it. It's going to give them a, a good solid basis to work from, especially using my products and such. It's, it's long overdue. Awesome. Awesome. Dr. Roman, I think she's having trouble getting her connecting her video. I see her, I see her name in a really, a really cool mountain. I presume she's on the top of that. <laughs> I see you there. Hope she can hear us. And... Okay, well, we'll get into it. Everyone's kind of in the chat. And so, hey, Mary. Hey, Elvira. Okay, Greg. So the, the topic of today, so for everybody in the group watching right now, I'm sure everybody saw Rodney Habib and Karen Becker's live yesterday on dandelions, making oils, making salves. It was phenomenal. I've got my, I've got my Moya head. I've got my dandelions, my heads here, the flowers that are drying and I've got some chopped up leaves over there. I saved the stems. I don't believe in really wasting. All right, let's see if this works. Yeah, so I'm drying the flower while we're waiting for Dr. Roman to, to come in. Um, I'm gonna be making ozonated dandelion self. So taking the best of Dr. Roman with the ozone and taking the best of Greg Tilford with the dandelions and making ozonated dandelion self. And I could probably buy it online for 20, 25 bucks, but it's not why when I can make it myself, right? right. So I think that's really, really cool. I'm gonna make a big batch. I'm gonna hand them out to my friends and family. Um, Really excited about that. So awesome. So I wanted to talk about dandelions today because that's kind of what I'm I'm currently obsessed with. <laughs> oh, and yesterday I was while I was picking looking for the dandelions, I was up to like here in, in tall grass, and I must have pulled off like five nasty ticks off me. It was it was super. It was awful. It was it was so stressful. Um, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, putting myself at risk for for Lyme disease while I'm just to make Somebody's got to do it. Right. So, um, but anyway, the topic of today, we're going to be, Greg's going to be discussing uh, a bunch of herbs in, in, in your spite, in your cabinet that you can, that you can add to your pet's bowl today. So Absolutely, Greg, yeah. I'm excited to hear about what these are. Yeah. I mean, you know, we get so tied up, those of us that study herbal medicine and, and such, that we get so tied up with the books and learning about the herbs that we, we, constantly see and hear about on news and and in herb courses we forget that there's a wealth of medicinal of medicine in our food cabinet i mean it's by virtue of how common and how how frequently we use it we just overlook it as medicine at all and some of the most powerful and safest remedies we have are right there in the spice cabinet the stuff that we're seasoning our food with um i could start with i could start with thyme culinary thyme thyme of species I mean, we're all familiar with it. It seasons chicken and vegetarian dishes and everything else beautifully. It has a really broad array of, of volatile oil constituents and various other antioxidants and such. It's, it's very antimicrobial. It has a constituent, actually one of the volatile oils is called thymol, very, very potent antibacterial, antimicrobial substance, so much so that it's actually the active ingredient in Listerine mouthwash. It's in there at a concentration of like 0.0095% or something really small like that, which is another good note because even though thyme, as you know, as a culinary herb, is very, very safe. We eat it all the time. It's, it's, it's generally regarded as safe for animals and for people in its whole form. But if you take that one volatile oil, thyme all away from it, concentrate it into an essential oil, it's very, very potent and potentially very toxic in small amounts. So don't assume that if you have a thyme essential oil, it's as safe as using culinary thyme. And that goes for any of these herbs that I'm talking about today. The essential oil is a different medicine. It's more refined, it's more focused, it's very strong. It's only using, representing a small portion of the entire plant. So just be aware. Thyme is amazing. I mean, it, it not only can be used for an antiseptic in the mouth by simply adding some water, mashing it up into a paste and applying it directly to gum lines or any kind of problem in the mouth where it might be needed to solve an infection. But it can be used as a skin rinse the same way. Make a tea out of it, cool the tea, make a good strong tea, cool it down and just pour it liberally over your dog or your cat. I mean, cats are cats. 
and let it drip dry on. It will, re it will relieve itching. It helps uh, heal flea bites. Um, and it smells good too. I mean, it's, it's really easy to use. Thyme is also a really good respiratory tonic. It's been used for thousands of years as a direct uh, remedy for asthmatics. It helps open up um, alveoli and helps improve breathing for asthmatic uh, sufferers, including animals. And so a little bit of the tea or tincture or even the, 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 uh, the dried thyme leaves can be added to the asthmatic pet's diet to help assist and tonify the body against those symptoms. So that's, that's just thyme. I mean, sage, you know, by the end of this, we'll be singing a, a song, you know, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. But, you know, sage, a similar way. I mean, it's the way I, I think I got really turned on to herbal medicine by my first wife. At one of those instances where I bit into a, a tortilla chip and I wasn't paying attention and the angle of the chip poked me in the gum and just kind of lodged itself up under a tooth and I got it out and I was bleeding and hurt like y'all. Naturally, the next day it started getting infections going on in there and it wasn't good. So Mary, she said, why don't you just make a, a poultice out of a, just a simple poultice out of, of a sage, wad it up in a big ball and just pack it under your gum and keep it there as long as you can. And sure enough, it brought out the swelling, it brought down the pain, it knocked down the infection. It was great. And, you know, all of those salvias, all of the mint family have similar properties. They help with the gut, they help relieve gas, they help with mouth pain, et cetera. Um, the mint family is huge. That includes thyme, rosemary, sage. They're, they're all in the mint family, believe it or not. Um, we Most of us have some form of green tea in the house. A green tea bag can be wetened and applied directly to a bite or a wound area or a burn. It's very antioxidant, very healing. can also be used in the mouth as well. can also be used as a skin rinse the same way. So, you know, for all of these issues with itchy skin and the symptomatic relief thereof, all of these kind of herbs can be made into a strong, cooled tea and used as a daily rinse very safely. One of my favorites also is peppermint for the same purpose. It can be used ex externally to relieve itchy skin as a skin rinse. Internally, it helps relieve gas, freshens breath, helps with motion sickness, add a little bit of ginger, and that will potentiate it as well. All of these things are, are very useful in, in the medicine cabinet and shouldn't be overlooked. Mm. There's yeah. probably things around the house too that are useful. I mean, either inside or outside of the house. I mean, the list is huge. I mean, this is not an exhaustive list at all. If you have a, an aloe plant, everybody knows the healing potential of aloe vera, but a lot of people are hesitant of using the plant in its raw form because they think by reading certain websites that somehow it's gonna be toxic to their pet. If you go on to ASPCA's toxic plant site, I believe it's listed as toxic to dogs, toxic to cats, toxic to everything. And the reason they list that is it's a reductionist perspective by which they see the aloes component, the latex that lines beneath the, 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 the skin of the plant and that juicy pith that we all know inside the leaf. There's a tiny little layer called aloes. It's a sticky yellow substance that is very strongly laxative. It's like a blasting powder of laxatives. And so if you ingest that, you're going to have a purgative effect. It's going to be pretty quick. The nice thing about squeezing out the juice of the, of, of the leaf, which you can just squeeze it right onto an affected area, a flea bite, a, any kind of irritation of the skin, is that you leave that aloe behind, the aloes component behind. The stuff you buy in bottles, the aloe juice, it's pressed out of the leaf, the aloes that component is not there. That's why it's safe for use. So as close as, as conceivably your coffee table, aloe vera. Marigolds, whether they be calendula or not outside, can be used the same way. They speed healing. Mm -hmm. They're known as vulneraries. You can take the flowers. Actually, you can take those, those dandelion flowers and, and make a healing salve like you have, or you can just decoct them into a strong tea to speed healing of wounds. Um, it actually increases cell reproduction at wound sites, improves the healing process, and helps the body heal wounds quicker. Um, those dandelion flowers also are rich in lecithin, which is really good for blood structure and helping the blood run smoothly. So, you know, everybody that has a yard of any kind has dandelion in it somewhere. Yeah. 
amazing. I, I see that he's picking the flowers, so I'm assuming he's going to make dandelion wine, I think, with it. Ah, there she is. I know her. That's Margot Roman. I know. I'm, I'm on an internet issue where can't have we get in the right place with it. So we haven't been had internet all day, so it's really hard not having access in the world. So it's going through my phone, through my computer. But I, can you even hear me? Is it clear? I can hear you fine, yeah. You're, you're a little fuzzy, but it, okay, it's good. Okay. Uh, it's good. I look terrible. <laughs> so I need to be fuzzy. Yeah, you look beautiful. So hi, Greg. I haven't seen you. Right. Oh, you're sweet. Thank yeah, it's you. funny we end up we, good we to run see into you. each other all over the place. I think we. I know. Last time nice. was at AHPA. The time before that, I walked into do a lecture with the Massachusetts Veterinary Medical Association's conference, and there yeah. she was. So, yeah, I was so excited that you lectured, and it was so packed with veterinarians. I really had great hopes that a lot of the vets in Massachusetts would start utilizing more herbal medicine, which would have been wonderful. Uh, I don't know how many actually, you know, at least they got the good introduction, which is great. And hopefully their yeah, their minds are much open to it and stuff. So, one, one vet at a time. So that's, you know, and, right. and my mission with those audiences is, to relax them and let them know that this isn't voodoo, this isn't snake oil, this isn't, you know, anything but the basis of internal medicine. That's what herbal, Western herbal medicine is. It's where it all started. And we're just, it, we're using substances and adding the energies of plants that we're familiar with. I mean, the substances are used to make our drugs. You know, you take uh, salicylic acid from willow bark to make aspirin. Mm -hmm. You take, you know, digoxin from digitalis. Right. You know, cardiac drugs and everything else. The herbalist is just expanding that. They're using the same compounds, but we're using the rest of the plant, the energies of the plant as well to a much broader purpose. I think, you know, I love teaching the vets like it in Massachusetts because the lights come on once you tell them, hey, you already know about this chemistry. This isn't new to you. This is what right. you use every day. We're going to expound upon it and deepen your experience with these kind of things. So, Absolutely. You know, and, and the thing is, it's, as we as we understand how valuable all these plants have been in our evolution and we look back on the evolution of the human being all, all these plants played a very big part of how the species was developed and the earlier forms of the plants and and when you go even further back we talk about you know the 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 microbiome of the plants of, of the, the soil and the animals that ingested it and all you know it's just it's going back and how our how our bodies really want to have these ancient uh, pieces of nutrition and ancient pieces to run to run this very very ancient microbiome, which is right. you know millions of years old. So it's really it's yeah. it's really you know and then we're trying to find a pharmaceutical that could just fit the spot. It doesn't work that way. We have to yeah. in all the other past story of the of the plant. And its components need to be part of how that body heals itself. So, it's really yeah. Good. And you know, it's funny you bring that up because we talked a lot about microbiome when I saw you in Massachusetts, and of course, it's really in the forefront of everything now. I mean, it's obviously very, very important. It, it ties into the answers relative to COVID nineteen. You know, as we discover, you know, this is not a respiratory pneumonia disease. This is a thrombotic blood disorder. And it, it, when you look deep enough into these sort of things, when you look into viruses, and from my perspective as a holistic herbalist, I see viruses as kind of the antibodies of our planet. And they're always here. They're always part of us. They're always part of our environment. The question is, what's out of balance with that microbiome that causes one specific pathogen to take advantage? And there's a lot of things out of balance with the microbiome. You know, we're interfering with it every day. And it's it's at the root of everything now. I I think it's it's really the basis of herbal medicine is understanding and, and embracing and respecting that ancient microbiome, all this collective of of microbes that live inside and outside of us in our environment, inside I mean, it's all one thing internally and externally. It's all related and it's vitally important. And well, and sadly, you know, you know I was going to say, sadly, with conventional thought at this point is we're trying to kill everything now. You know, everything's being wiped with Purell. Everything is being sterilized. Everything is being separated from a balance. And, and you know, at this right. point, 
that's the only tool we have because they're not interested in learning other tools to stop this virus from invading the body. And, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I think herbal medicine has got so many more solutions than conventional doesn't have any, um, as well as, you know, of course, medical ozone um, and utilizing ultraviolet light therapies and a lot of these other antiviral things that have been worked for 100, over 100 years. Why can't we go to those versus trying to find a new drug? So anyway, yeah. <laughs> that's my mission yeah, right know. now. I'm just sad about what's happening with 100,000 people dead. I think our medical profession has failed so badly. Um, and it's sad. They, you know, we're trying to celebrate them as heroes. And I, I'm celebrating the people that are cleaning up after the doctors as the heroes, <clears throat> not the not the people, the doctors who are not giving, even having their mind open to trying some other herbs and there are Chinese herbs that have already been shown to help with COVID. They've already had placebo double you know, studies done in China, and you can't talk about them. That's not fair. Yeah. That's not fair. Yeah. So. I'm finding it interesting that in Amazon, in Amazonia, some of the Aboriginal tribes there, instead of reaching toward a rainforest herb to, to confront COVID, they're reaching for Artemisia wormwood which obviously was brought huh. over by missionaries probably into South America a long time ago. But artemisinin, which is an, a component of that herb, has been shown to have activity against various blood parasites and various blood disorders because mm -hmm. it has the ability of crossing blood barriers very quickly, which is also one of the warning signals of the herb too. And it's in an alcohol extraction, it contains a substance called thuja, which is a very potent, mm -hmm. medicinally potent um, all in the oil that can get into the bloodstream. Unfortunately, it can cross brain barriers and over long years affect the brain and the liver as well. You know, and there's theory that Vincent Van Gogh kind of went insane by drinking too much absinthe as a result of that. So we have to be careful with stuff like that. But it's one of the herbs I'm looking at very closely as as something that might help with the onset of COVID. That and cannabis. I mean, there's some really mm -hmm. There's some really cool studies out that yeah. suggest that just smoking cannabis will block the virus in the lungs. I mean, that's so simple. It really? has to make sense. Yeah. And it's you know, cannabis has wow. wow. got broad antioxidant qualities to it. So my guess is that the CBD rich strains are the ones that reach for. But I think that probably any of them probably have some activity in the lungs. And. When you get into things that begin in the lungs and where they manifest there and move into the body from a holistic, especially preventative standpoint, it's difficult because it's, you know, unlike certain leaders that suggest that we should inhale Lysol, which is something we can't do. The question is, what can you get into the lungs to have a direct intervention immediately? And cannabis is one of them and garlic is another one of them. I mean, when you chew on raw garlic and you breathe that that stinky breath all day, that anytime you smell that garlic smell, you're breathing like a hundred different sulfur compounds that all have an antibacterial, antimicrobial right. immune stimulating quality. And by breathing it from your breath, it's actually going into your lungs. So it's another one to look at. But and that that's another yeah, good example. That, we started that, talking about all the stuff that's available in your refrigerator in your home that we tend to overlook. Garlic's amazing. You just use it in small amounts in animals. You don't use it all the time every day. It's very safe. It's it's a good antioxidant. It's good for blood structure. It's a good immune booster. It helps uh, keep parasites yep. in check in, in the gut. It's a wonderful herb. No, yeah. and I'm, I'm thinking because I, I we're you know of course I'm really trying to encourage people to think about ozone therapy for for COVID, uh, although we can't really talk about it because that's it. There's no double placebo blind study, but there's no double placebo blind study for anything that is for COVID. There's nothing, not right. even what's done in the hospital now, just giving them saline is not double placebo blind study. So right. whenever the physicians come out with that kind of, we can't do that because we need a double placebo blind study. They don't have anything, <laughs> you know, they've got nothing. And so when a hundred thousand people die, I think you need to keep your mind a little farther open than just say, well, we're doing the standard of care. Standard of care is a failure here, real failure. And and I, you know, thinking of that, what you just said about the garlic, to put the ozonated olive oil, which you can you can put in your throat, 
mix it with a extractive our garlic so that the ozonides and the garlic are being inhaled by your by into your lungs mm -hmm. might be a really cool thing to try i mean it's not going to hurt you i mean you can eat ozonate oil they use it in it to kill uh helobacter in and that's a double placebo blind study that was done with mm -hmm. ozonate oils so if you if if you put some and you put garlic in it um, and you breathe the, the um, you know, the, the garlic, um, what's the, the um, well, the sulfur compounds, but there's not one specific in garlic, but you know, to, to just get that into your lungs, why, why not? It's gonna hurt you. Right, exactly. I mean, you know, the hospital's gonna hurt you more than anything else is gonna hurt you. Well, so, especially uh, until now, I mean, in, in, the, in the medical realm, the approach to COVID has been a shot in the dark, really. I mean, that's why everybody in New York City went immediately on the ventilators. You know, their lungs are working at full capacity. They're not full of fluid, but they can't transport oxygen. Right. So, and, and you know, when you, when, you, when you put raw oxygen onto an inflamed, in, into inflamed alveoli and lung tissues, what do you get? You get more inflammation, right? So we, we, we barking up the wrong tree and we're starting to get an idea of that now. But the more important thing, and this is everybody's responsibility, is we need to learn how to take better care of ourselves, and we're also seeing strong ties. I just saw a study came out today out of the UK. Three hundred and seventy thousand test subjects, basically in this study, have tied it to environmental problems, to air pollution, to overcrowding, to a, a dirty living environment, and that correlated with you know, a weak immune system, the elderly. Pre, pre, pre predispositions like cardiovascular disease, um, heart disease and such, those things combined are, those are the death cocktail with COVID. Right. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that, you know, I think viruses are very much like the antibodies of the living earth, Gaia, and we're seeing them go to work right now. But at the same time, we have these clues. We're seeing the air clear up in our cities. We're seeing, you know, dolphins swimming back in the harbors that haven't gone into harbors for decades. We're seeing all of these signs that, you know, there is a positive response by our quarantine, right? By us take putting less pressure upon the world. We need to wake up and pay note to that because the reason those things are happening are the, it is the basis of what happened here because we're, we're, we're putting too big of a footprint into the environment and the and the bio, microbiome, and you know our, our our elderly are not healthy. We're smoking too many cigarettes. There's too much obesity. You know we've got all these predispositions. It's time to wake up, take care of each other, and take care of ourselves better. I guarantee you that if we don't, we're going to see more and more of these. You know, and it's you know COVID nineteen is a terrible thing. Hundred thousand people in America alone is a terrible thing, but compared to what nature can throw at us, it's nothing. Yeah. You know, the, the dinosaurs disappeared relatively overnight from a, from an asteroid, you know. We're just as susceptible as anything else on this planet. We need to learn some humility and live with it. Well, let me ask the question. This right. is a personal, personal question, but you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but the, the COVID-19, the vaccine, you're gonna get it or not gonna get it and why? Well, first of all, any vaccine that's cranked out that quickly raises a lot of question marks in my mind. Second, I'm not a big proponent of vaccines. I don't like I don't like the fact that there's been basically 30 years of not cover up, but just total just totally ignored the safety monitoring systems that were put into place 30 years ago for the vaccine industry. They were supposed to report and have a, a continuous study on safety monitoring for vaccines was never done and it's never been done on a yearly basis at all like it was supposed to. 30 years of vaccines, we have no safety studies. We're still using really bad carriers. Um, we're confusing the immune system. The answer isn't in how effectively we can try to control and conquer the nature within us or without us. It's about learning how to live with it and learning how to boost our immunity naturally and how to boost not just our immunity, but improve the immunity of the world around us, so to speak, improve our living environment, do something for the environment. It's really important. I mean, vaccines, whether they work or not, at best, they're putting a synthetic substitute, a substitute for what the body is naturally designed to do. Um, I'm not a big proponent. No, I won't get one. You know, I, there's word that 
you know, we might get forced into carrying a, a vaccine card and I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. But, um, you know, let's see how they go. Let's see how this, this whole vaccine research goes for this thing right now. I think prevention yeah, can I'm be done in other you. ways. I, well, I, I agree with Greg. I mean, pretty much everything you said, I totally agree with. Um, to have a vaccine pumped out that quickly, I don't have security in that. There's not studies that will show you the, you know, 10 year out, how your body is A, gonna have immunity for it, B, is it going to cause some ser serious effect of cancer or fibromyalgia or MS or some other debilitating an autoimmune disease and attack your own cells and make you more, you know, vulnerable to other serious diseases. Um, and I, again, the adjuvants that are in, in our vaccines that we use for animals are terrible. Um, and they're carrying those over and putting them into the human line of vaccines. Uh, I just, I feel like we, we have an opportunity to help the immune system get stronger because we're really understanding more about what runs the immune system, which if 80% of your immune system comes from your gut, why are we consuming glyphosate, which is Roundup that kills, you know, kill, is an antibiotic? for the intestinal tract. Right. We have to navigate away from how we've been trying to kill off the microbiome and the balance in our body and then figure out how we can utilize that, that inner relationship and that symbiosis to keep the immune system thriving and protecting the host that it's in because it doesn't want the host to die. So it wants the host to live. So it's trying to do it. But if everything in there is out of balance and it's so it's so distorted. It's not going to be able to navigate a healthy a healthy you know a host. So I think it's I, the, when we come to vaccine. I am afraid that the same thing is that they're going to force everybody to get a vaccine that they have not had full studies on, and and the side effects could be even worse than the, than than what the vaccine is trying to protect. So um, I okay. think there needs to be a lot of educated studies that are not funded by drug companies and people invest in it financially. It has to be done by people that are really caring and compassionate and don't have their finger on the, you know, on the cash register. The question is, who is that? I don't know. I, I mean, huh? It's, it's to find those individuals that have a, you know, have, are really looking at this as what is it, in for not what is it in for for me and my stockholders and my producers and my whole business model but what is it in here to help help us keep our population of the world healthy um educate them make them stronger by understanding how to take care of themselves you know versus waiting for a drug to come along and so that they can keep you know damaging their body damaging the environment damaging our earth and just saying it's just keep doing what you're doing so yeah yeah, I mean, and there's, it's a it's a personal responsibility. I think the greatest the greatest way out of this and into the future is, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but especially in the most developed countries, and especially in the United States, we're so used to being a push button society. We expect our doctors and our, our healthcare professionals to take care of us. We expect our researchers to give us all of the answers, and you know, we expect them to know us and our bodies and our issues better than we do. And that's the mistake, is people need to learn how to take better care of themselves, to work preventatively, eat better food, be more conscious of their environment, take better care of their elders, be protective of their elders. Locking ourselves away forever in a room or quarantining ourselves and sticking our heads in the sand until this goes away is not gonna do anything but drive our economy down and starve people to death instead of dying from COVID. You know, we've got to move our way through this responsibly and it requires all of us, you know, it, and it's not to operate through this isn't brain surgery. You know, I mean, if you're in a big location and you're lots of people and you're going to be close, put a mask on, you know, if you're around people you think are compromised, put a mask on. Just be polite. Social distance. Yeah, if you're close enough to spit in somebody's face when you talk, you're too close anyway. We should have known that forever, you know. So it's about thinking. It's about you know, taking I, I've, our I've been, you know, in, into consciousness. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, 
you know, I, I got injured. I, I've told the story to Peter's audience, but I got injured in veterinary school 42 years ago and a, a cow threw me against a fa fence and a five inch nail went through my back of my chest and hit my sternum and hit my pericardium. So I have a paralyzed diaphragm on my left side and have no spleen because they misdiagnosed me and took my spleen. So for 42 years, I have searched and searched and searched for ways to navigate my immune system. And of course, when I first had this happen, they told me I needed to live on antibiotics for the rest of my life and never be a veterinarian because I am exposed to too many zoonotic and viruses. So stop being a veterinarian, find something that you can do that is, doesn't deal with animals because you're gonna get sick. And so I tried for a while and every time I would look for something that I could find that maybe would make me stronger so that I could do my passion, which is to work as a veterinarian. And, you know, for 42 years have looked and seeked and studied and got, and to sort of get to the point where you realize that all the antibiotics that I took for seven years and all the, the con condemnation that I got for feeding a raw diet, because I would kill myself with salmonella and coli with a raw food and how I would die if I ever did that. 30 years later, my immune system is a lot stronger than if I had stayed on antibiotics for the last 42 years, which is what I was told right. never to come off antibiotics. So it's, you, you learn, you know, how to, to navigate, you know, your health. But the whole point of learning this stuff is to share it with other doctors who this is their first time getting exposed to a, to being a possible virus that you could die from. I lived like that for 42 years. I used to go, I still go on a plane with a mask and gloves. I've done it for 42 right. years. People think I'm nuts, but I don't want to get an upper respiratory infection on a plane because I can't afford to do it. But the thing is they, what I, what I'm hoping is that doctors will listen to people that have scientifically analyzed this stuff for 42 years, instead of saying, Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, we know everything and you know nothing. And um, my point of getting around to this is that we, all have to share everything that we know. And you as an herbalist is so important because you've understood the, 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 the synergistic and dynamic aspect of plants that has helped the animals stay healthy. They know innately how to take this herb and eat this when they're sick, you know, and they want that. And we have to learn, start to start to learn that again. We've separated ourselves so much from, you know, from the real world of life on this planet. Yeah, yeah. I, it seems that there's 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 the earth and that reality and nature and that reality, and then there's a the human universe that we insist is something different outside and not as vulnerable, you know. And we need to tie all of them together. And you know, the most exciting thing in the herbal front, and I think herbalism is it, it has to do with plants, but it's it's learning how to coexist with plants. And how to how to use them as part of the grander system that everything else on Earth uses. You know, they're they're the medicine of the planet. Every creature on Earth uses herbal medicine, and it, it's not so much the selection of herbs that's important for us as humans to grasp right now, but it's the it's the principle of holistic use that's so important. It's becoming included in the, finding a way to step back into the circle of life and not just utilizing things and, and exploiting herbs, but step into their world, giving back to their world, understand how they serve everything else there, and understand the deeper meaning of what herbalism is. And that's learning how to heal in unison, harmonize with the natural um, systems that exist here. That's the, the biggest challenge that humankind has in front of it right now. And the most important thing that the herbalist can convey is, hey, you're stepping into a system. It's not, it's not just using plants like you'd use over-the-counter drugs, you're not just using something, you know, this substance to take out this symptom. You're stepping into a natural system that you need to understand and, and spend some time becoming part of. And once we do, we'll find ourselves working way more harmoniously with the world around us. Dandelions, you know, Peter's on a dandelion kick, my favorite herb is dandelions. I love dandelions. But the greatest thing that they bring to us is that when we appreciate <laughs> the incredible medicinal values and neutral nutritive values that those plants have, then we realize that the plants that our neighbors are spraying with Roundup have a strong purpose and they, they have a very important purpose in nature. They've got that long taproot 
if you get into a mature plant, Peter, you'll know what I'm talking about. They're like digging up a small phone pole sometimes, right? Yeah. We used to call those the earth nail because they have the ability to go through topsoil and penetrate hard pan soils and bring nutrients out of the earth from levels that normally nothing else can into the tissue, into the leaves, then it composts back into topsoil. So it's bringing nutrients from in the earth mm. out of, into the environment. It's using the sunlight, you know, it's, it's using chlorophyll, it's, it's alive and it's creating all these medicinal chemistries in the process. And, you know, it's understanding those process, respecting it, not, you know, thinking twice before you, you paint your backyard down with an herbicide or something, that these things are here for a purpose. They're here to serve us and to serve the animals around us. And that is the key, you know. And the more we fight against things like weeds or even disease, especially minor diseases, because they're an inconvenience to us, you know, the more damage we do. And right. we just need, you know, we need to get over that. We need to, you know, slap ourselves in the face, realize that we're not gods, and we need to get to work at being participants of this planet. And Greg, you were you were in the you were um, talking about the different herbs in your in someone's cabinet that they could add. So you yeah. talked about thyme. You talked about uh, what were the other ones? Rose we talked about briefly about uh, peppermint. We talked about green tea. We talked a little bit about marigolds. Um, mm -hmm. We haven't talked about rosemary yet. That's a great one. Great. These are the basic, the basic staples of the herbs that you can just add like today to your pet bowl? Or? Absolutely. I mean, rosemary is a really popular one. In fact, rosemary is used all the time in natural product manufacturing. Rosemarinic acid, rosemary extract is strongly antioxidants used as a preservative in organic foods, in medicines and such. Um, it works just as well as an antioxidant and an anti-antiseptic on the skin. In the body, it's, it's a relaxant when taken internally. It helps bring about a calming um, state of mind. Externally, it's also stimulant. So it, it's an interesting herb because it'll stimulate various functions on the surface of the body, like peripheral vasodilation. It's probably the best herb I can think of to heal a, a burn. In fact, I learned about rosemary oil um, long before I was, I considered myself a professional herbalist. In fact, I was a paramedic back then. And we had this terrible contract where we had to transport people into the burn unit in uh, Southern California out of San Bernardino. So I got a lot of experience working with burn patients, but I was talking to an ER nurse or uh, burn, the burn center nurse. She said, uh, if I ever burn myself severely, the first thing I'm going to do is just immerse myself in lavender oil. She said, it works amazing. You know, and one day, sure enough, I burned, I scalded my arm really severely. I knew I'd be scarred probably for a long time. The skin was just sloughing off. It hurt like hell. And so I, I remembered what she said. I took lavender oil. I poured it on. It hurt like hell. I mean, it was so painful because immediately the capillaries around that burn open up and try to push more blood into the area. And basically what it's doing is it's circulating blood and repairing tissue immediately around the periphery of that burn. So it speeds the healing exponentially really fast. And you know, I have no scars, it healed in three times, you know, the time, but digressing, you don't want to use straight oils on dogs or cats, um, but you can infuse the herb, you can make a strong tea and use it externally or internally. Um, it's a good nervous system tonic. It's good for older animals. Um, it helps kind of pep them up and, and get the, the nervous system working more more uh, vigorously, so to speak. Um, it's, it's a great herb. Lately, I've been using it as a steam, as a face steam, to open up mm -hmm. the lungs and the, and, the, uh, and the sinuses. And if, you have, if you're lucky enough to have some rosemary plants in your garden, just harvest a bunch of sprigs. You don't have to take the leaves off or anything and pack them into um, a pot of water, cover it with water, and bring it to a boil. And once it comes to the boil, turn it off, cover it with a towel and uh, let it sit there and steep for about 20 minutes and then put your face, lift up the towel, put it over your head, put your face right over over that, that cooking vessel and 
breathe deeply for about five minutes and you'll feel your lungs open up. You'll feel your sinuses open up. And um, probably another good preventative measure with COVID because it's going right into the starting point. It's a, it's a blocking mechanism and an antioxidant. Wow. Amazing plant, you know, and we take it for granted. It's so fascinating. So, wow, a lot of it, a lot of, uh, a lot of awesome suggestions. Um, so, one of the one of the products I have here is licorice root. I don't know if you can see it. There we go, licorice root. This is one of my favorites because I use it to raise cortisol naturally with Allie, and I, I think I mentioned that in the last time, and. Uh, I confirmed. It, 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 Dr. Roman used to have like, the cortisol went from low to deficient to now. Um, so I thought that was really fascinating. And Dr. Chris Besant, who's also an herbal, um, herbalist, uh, suggested this to me, and it, it's been great. And so, but there's a lot of controversy with licorice, correct? Like, is it because it has? It's kind of like a corticosteroid. Can we talk briefly about some of the? Because it has a cortisoid, a corticosteroid-like effect, it, it has a very profound effect on inflammation. It has an influence on the body's own cortisol system. It will it either either mimics the production and replaces it, or stimulates the body's own production of cortisol in a beneficial tonic way. It, it doesn't overload it or overdose it. You know, like a lot of things. The controversy about licorice came from the old days in Europe when. They actually made licorice candy out of real licorice instead of just anise flavoring and, and corn syrup like most of the licorice is made out of today. And when you make licorice by the traditional means, you're actually making a very strong extract. I mean, you're, you're extracting it down into a solid form. So it's very concentrated. And so the issues came up when kids would just be eating the stuff all the time. And pretty soon a few of them were found to have water retention issues and and side effects that are similar to those of corticosteroid drugs. But you really have to overdo it to see those. I've been using licorice and recommending licorice throughout my career as a veterinary herbalist, and all of the vets I work with use it, and I have yet to see a side effect relative to something we see with cortisol. It just it, It's not manifesting. It's actually the most commonly prescribed herb in Chinese medicine. It just tends to be hidden in formulas because it's thought to potentiate and make other herbs in those formulas stronger by virtue of its presence. So it's used all the time. And, you know, the, the, the worries mostly unfounded, unless you're going to use a lot of it continuously. Like for instance, humans using it for stomach ulcers every day in large doses are generally using deglycerized licorice to that avail. So they don't have to worry about those side effects, but one of the one of the interesting things that you mentioned in our in our first live together, which I reposted earlier this week, uh, for people to watch. But you mentioned a lot of vets carry the animal essential tinctures in their clinic, like especially Dr. Roman does. Uh, now you, I, I believe you mentioned in our last live that some veterinarians will use licorice roots uh, to kind of stabilize the dog's inflammation. Say they have lymphoma while they're weaning off the prednisone. Right. So the is that correct? Can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, from, from everything that we've gathered, and again, there's no double blind placebo study here, just you know, a few hundred years of anecdotal evidence, um, is it tends to potentiate the effects, it tends to strengthen the effect of corticoid drugs. So, you know, on one side you'll see the, the adverse effects, the side effects will be used with caution if in conjunction with corticosteroid drugs, but the blessing of that is, is because it potentiates it, conceivably you can lower the dose of those corticosteroid drugs by adding licorice into the mix. And then I've seen many cases where licorice can be increased, the corticosteroid drugs are systematically over time decreased, where you can basically wean off of corticosteroid drugs or at least get a, a minimal dose of PRED going in in conjunction with licorice. Licorice doesn't, licorice is, you know, corticosteroid, the difference, the corticosteroid drugs are going to damage and affect the liver. They're going to swell the liver. There's going to be inf liver inflammation and such. They have a profound negative effect. Licorice, actually, a lot of people don't know this, but it has very strong hepatoprotective properties, very similar to that of, of milk thistle. In fact, in many ways, it works better than milk thistle because it stimulates liver function in more ways than milk thistle does. So it's actually healthy to the liver in, in normal doses. 
So it's actually supporting the liver instead of compromising the liver like corticosteroid drugs do. So it's, yeah, it's, it's an amazing one. You know, it's, what, you, you include licorice a lot in, in a lot of your tinctures actually. So that's probably why mm -hmm. I so, use it so frequently. Dr. Roman, what are some of your favorite herbs? Oh, well, I mean, I love turmeric and I love licorice and um, I love ginger. I use a lot of ginger in my own health and turmeric. <laughs> and so, um, so, you know what, I, I mean, if I, I, I milk thistle, uh, hawthorn, um, you know, Romania, I mean, there's ones that I, that I use a lot when I have an animal that, that has kidney issues, I'll go to one section of the herbal support. And then if I have an animal with cancer, I not only use, you know, mushrooms as well as, as herbal medicine and, and incorporate the, the nutritive value of the mushrooms. Um, so in the, you know, support for cancer, um, I use the, the turmeric and the ginger and the, um, you know, it, it depends on the type of cancer, you know, where it is, you know, what kind of tissue I'm, right. I'm dealing with. I'll try to use specific types of herbs that are nutritive to that organ system. Wow. So, but, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, that, your approach, I mean, is, we're is so great. totally on the same page, Margo. I mean, yeah, I know. You know, the, approach to, the, the approach to cancer in my mind isn't, yeah, I don't even think in terms of cancer. I don't care about what they call a disease. What I care about is what systems are affected and what systems of the body can we support in its efforts against whatever's happening to clear up that imbalance. Cancer is an imbalance. Whatever is left and functioning to fight against that cancer, whatever that imbalance is, we need to support. And that's where herbs come in. We can strengthen those support mechanisms. It's not, you know, a, a cancer cure-all. It's really pretty simple. We're supporting the body in a time of crisis. And, you know, but and I think I, I mentioned this, we were talking about it in, in Massachusetts, but, um, you know, my feeling is that you can take all these herbs and you can take them all, but, but if your body doesn't know how to navigate it through its immune system via the microbiome, right. it may not be able to take advantage of the full mix and right. potential of the interaction of this microbe with that herb and then this microbe with that herb together actually make it absorbed and has it utilized within this the correct organ system so there's so much we do not know at all and i i have to say any placebo double placebo blind study done on any drug uh in the past 25 years before we knew more about the microbiome needs to be redone because that, that, that even though it's double placebo blinded study, we don't know what the people came in with this terrible dysbiosis and was given right. that. And that's why they had a terrible reaction or didn't have a reaction or had a very good reaction because they were missing things in their microbiome. So I, I really want to throw it out to all these you know, academic individuals, because nobody understood where people came in in their microbiome. They have, you know, females that are under the age of 35 that are in this weight control. Those are your divisions, but they're not looking at this microbiome, which could be a completely, completely different scenario of their statistics that they came out with. Absolutely. You know, and even understand how to metabolize it. So. Yeah. Well, and, and the microbiome thing is so complex and so important is, you know, it goes into nutrition too. I mean, how often do we, you know, we see these foods that say, oh, we've got this much protein. We got all these great ingredients. It's got blueberries. It's got antioxidants. It's got green foods. It's got all this great stuff. And granted, it's great food. But if the microbiome's out of balance in the subject's body, it might not be able to utilize all those great foods, you know, and food that's not properly utilized, even if it's great food, can produce toxic compounds if they're not eliminated, you know? So it all goes back to the microbiome and how the, and how our body metabolizes things, you know, and we've got to pay attention. It has to be on the cutting edge of science coming up. It has to. Yeah. Amazing. All right, speed round Q and A. We got a couple of questions to get through. Yep. Uh, April asks, what can I do with a dried burdock root, dried dandelion leaves and dried dragolus for my pup with cancer? Are they helpful? I have all of them, but I'm not sure what to do with them. Do I boil it, put the tea in their bone broth, or grind and put the powder in their meal? And how much would I give to a 25-pound pump? Thanks. 
you know, that's a great com that's a great combination of herbs because you have you have the dandelion root, which is going to help clear the liver. It's going to help stimulate liver function and, and remove toxins from the bloodstream. Vitally important, really important. The the astragalus is going to boost immunity. It's got a strong affinity toward kidneys. It's got a strong affinity toward waste elimination, and also the energetics will help raise energy levels as an adaptogen um, against infection. It will help boost immunity. And the third herb was uh, burdock. Burdock root, another classic yeah. liver herb that has it's got its own list of, of anti-cancer studies, um, antioxidant to various kinds of cancer, works at liver level. Oops, sorry about that. And um, I would take all three of them in equal amounts and just grind it into a powder and add it to the food every day. You can add as much as you want. It's a, they're, they're food, they're food safe herbs. You know, astragalus is traditionally used in it's thrown okay. in the pots of food all the time. It's eaten, it's boiled, it's it's in soups all over Asia, you know, and for that purpose, just to raise vitality. And a tablespoon for a pound of food every day would be great for any dog, those three herbs. So uh, on the burdock, is there any particular time of the year that you shouldn't harvest the root, or is it safe to do the root year-round? In, in most, in most places, in burdock is a biennial meaning that the first year it will it'll sprout from seed, it will create this basal rosette of leaves and then it won't do anything. The second year it will come back and it will shoot to the sky, create its flowers, bloom, and then die off for good and reseed itself, the root will die. So you want the root. And so you're gonna to wanna to harvest the root as late in the fall of the first year as possible or as early before the plant dies, but close to fall after the bloom in the second year because you don't wanna harvest the dying root. But the general so rule for roots is fall. Now, if you harvest it in the spring, it's probably lost a lot of its its life force because it's doing doing leaves or what is what? Yeah, the, well, it's still useful. Because uh, I know, so it much in my better. yard. <laughs> yeah, so. it's, 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 it's certainly better to eat in the spring. You know, gobo is what it's called in Chinese medicine and Chinese cooking. It's really good in stir fries. Okay. You can grate okay. it up and such. It's way better in the spring to eat. But yes, in the in the fall, all of the energies come from the leaves back into the root of the plant to keep the root alive through the through winter, at least on that first year. And uh, in the spring, most of the energy is in the top of the plant for reproductive purposes and for and and you know to collect sunlight and everything else. So the general rule for for roots is to harvest them in the fall for that purpose for that reason. Okay, interesting. Sherry asks. I would love if you can ask Greg Tilford which which of his herbal products can support the liver, heart, brain, and kidneys, especially the kidneys, and can you recommend dosages? Well, I like your senior I support. Think, uh, <laughs> yeah, the senior support is really good, yeah. You can also, um, the heart health is really good, too, because uh, anything that contains a combination of hawthorn and ginkgo does something really special for the kidneys and improves circulation throughout the body. But where ginkgo really plays its claim to fame, everyone thinks of it as a memory drug and it is, it's great. If I could remember to take it in the morning, I'd take it. But it's, uh, it's, it's really got an affinity toward opening small capillaries and the kidneys are second only to the brain and its need for oxygen and blood flow. And oftentimes those little capillaries are occluded. And Hawthorne as a combination, not only allows the ginkgo to get in there and open up that circulation, but Hawthorne has an affinity toward the coronary artery that actually dilates and gently stimulates heart function to where it will deliver more blood without increasing blood pressure. So anytime you have increased blood circulation you have better cell washing, so to speak, you're improving immunity. And everything else can be built on from that, uh, especially for a kidney compromised. Astragalus is another good tonic for kidney compromised animals, just uh, all alone and by itself. But yeah, I, I would go for the senior support. I'll always take you know the doctor's recommendations. And um, another one to consider would be would be that one. The, uh, I'm, I'm, the I'm listening to the you know the the mechanism of these or herbs and actually for covid you know to use uh both the ginkgo and the hawthorn together because if you're opening up capillaries and these people are not getting good microcirculation and getting blood clots in there you know it might be a 
you know, also two pieces to add to, you know, COVID patients too as well. Right. You know, so. Absolutely. You know, you know, an ounce of prevention is not worth a pound of cure. Prevention is the cure. It really is. I mean, and, and that's where we're going with COVID is we, we can prevent this. We can we can avoid having it. And in the process of learning this one, we're going to prevent a lot more from going wrong. We're learning. Do you have any recommendations for an older dog with urinary incontinence due to canine cognitive disorder? We have a new brain awake formula that incorporates Bacopa and other brain of ginkgo and other herbs that work at higher brain centers. It's a tough one because a lot of those kind of urinary incontinence cases, and correct me if I'm wrong, Margo, they really are triggered at higher brain centers or by hormones, hormone issues that are really hard to approach. So you just kind of have to go from one remedy to another until something sticks, so to speak. Um, if it's a cognitive disorder, you need to wake up the brain in medium chain triglycerides. Um, Turmeric's another good one. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff on the market that will help support brain function. Certainly worthwhile trying those out. Absolutely. Wow. You can also and, and you, can just herbs, you can use herbs to strengthen the, 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 the structures in, in the urinary tract, but it often isn't effective for, you know, if, if it's a neurological onset like we're talking about. So, well, one of the things that I found that really helped these older dogs is when we did the microbiome restorative therapy with my younger dogs that have intact uteruses that are, and even the ones that are in heat, and to use that, it totally changed their mental health. I mean, they, I had old dogs, you know, an old, you know, 14 year old dog that was sort of demented and, you know, not, had no really vitality. We gave uh, Baxter a fecal transplant when my dog was in heat and he's up running around humping everything. I thought that was amazing. That's amazing, yeah. I've amazing. seen amazing. It is I've seen amazing things just from changes in diet. When raw food is added to the, the scenario, you see the brain wake up. You see, you know, it's almost like Jekyll and Hyde in some animals. The changes yeah. in, in personality yeah. and behavior. Just by getting the right nutrition, the right proteins that actually make it to the brain, cross blood barriers and such. You know, and again, having the diversity of the microbes that may have been lost in that dog's lifetime from six treatments of antibiotics and, and you know, a bunch of NSAIDs and things like that, giving them a healthy, young, vibrant microbiome might be enough to make them absorb their, their raw diet, absorb the herbs, and be able to get it to across the blood-brain barrier into the brain. So just something right. to think about. Yeah. Uh, Greg, will your online course teach all the ways to use herbs, fresh or dried, whole or part, recipes and dosing? No, because I don't think I know all the ways. There's too many ways. No, the first the first segment of the course I'm writing is to really bring people into awareness of the principles of effective use. To get out of the mindset of using this herb for that symptom, to get out of the mindset by which we use conventional drugs and to start adopting herbs into our daily lives to maintain health and homeostasis in a preventative way and in a tonic capacity, tonic meaning that we're using herbs not as a replacement for anything, not to bypass anything, but simply to strengthen the body's natural innate abilities to heal itself. And so the beginning of that course, I'll, I'll probably do it in different segments rather than try to write the whole thing over again in one big lump, is there'll be an introductory course, uh, it will go into tonic herbs, It'll go into dosing. It will go into, into medicine making, but it, it'll get there gradually. It won't go in right away. There will be recipes. There will be dosing. There will be a section on safety and side effects, too. Wonderful. What herbs support the pancreas? I'm sorry, what? Excuse me. What herbs uh, support the pancreas? Um, red clover. A lot of the clovers do. Actually, you know, I find it. I read a study a few years ago that suggested that white sweet clover, I forgot the Latin name, it grows on roadsides everywhere, escaped from, you know, from from livestock feeds and such, maybe specific toward reducing inflammation in the pancreas. But I have to look at that more, more, uh, more closely. Right now, pancreatic support, I think Dr. Margo would agree, enzyme support, microbiome support, anything that takes pressure off what the, what the pancreas is naturally designed to do 
replace the enzymes with plant-based enzymes because it won't affect pancreatic function um, as best you can and just kind of mm -hmm. replicate it with diet. Mm -hmm. Am I correct on that, doctor? Yeah, I yeah, and, you know, I, I, I totally agree. And one of the things that I have found is that ozone therapy brings down the inflammation. It, it, to me, it is the best way to treat pancreatic uh, inflammation, mm. you know, whether it, it be from cancer or from pancreatitis. Um, and we're doing it in multiple ways with ultraviolet light, um, just as ozone rectally, because it goes into to the liver, but also as intraperitoneal ozone injections um, works to, to cut down perit you know, peritonitis and inflammation in the abdomen. So there's a, because you're, you're putting oxygen and, and healing it with you know, high levels of oxygen in an area where it, the, the body, when you have inflammation, you're not having enough circulation to that pancreas. And it's really hard to get circulation to the pancreas. So yeah, that yeah. just I, I, it really is great. But, you know, adding, you know, any way to help with the gut and, and absorption is going to make the pancreas not work as hard and give it a chance yeah. to, to, to rest. Yeah, preserving and utilizing whatever's left, basically, is what we're trying to do here. Awesome. Well, this has been amazing. So we're at 65 minutes. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Do you guys have You're any questions so to touch upon? Any, any last? Thank uh, you. I wasn't here for your introduction, but Greg has been a real pioneer in bringing veterinary um, herbal medicine. I mean, he was one of my first herbal books that I got. Um, and, and I used it a lot. I mean, I really, you know, was using it quite a bit and I, you know, the, having him coming out with these glycerin based herbal products for cats, especially, um, and dogs too, um, was wonderful because they, they're palatable, the animals will take them. Um, and so it, and the combinations are really thoughtful. And so, you know, you can get them also online too. I know aren't you, 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 don't you have them, yeah. you, know, yeah. you can get them. Uh, you know, we carry them at a clinic, but I was so thrilled when he came out with all these different ways. So it's easy for a veterinarian to be able to pick one of those out that would match up with the symptoms and the organ dis dysfunction that you have to be caring for. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Margo. And I, I want to have you on, the, on your Vital Pet, my podcast. So I'm going to give you a call. And okay. You'll come on? Sure. Absolutely. Awesome. I look forward. <laughs> Poop. No, just kidding. <laughs> but there's a lot to talk about in poop. <laughs> so. There is. Well, thank you both very much. Thank and you. Uh, just hang on one second. And uh, I want to say goodbye to everybody. And thank you for joining. This has been a fantastic discussion, very unique discussion. Haven't seen this done before. So that's why I wanted Dr. Roman on as well as a surprise. And hope everyone enjoyed and learned something. I learned a ton. So see you soon. Thank you. Thank